People were laying in shit. They were not being fed for days. And the professionals were paralyzed. Just paralyzed. I mean, they wouldn't go in the rooms. This ad hoc group of volunteers turned into the Gay Men's Health Crisis Center. It would become a significant force in the many battles that lay ahead. A vital and immediate task was to help find out how the disease was being spread. Research was still confined largely to individual doctors and a small CDC team. It was underfunded and unsuccessful. When I had to scratch off names on my infections list because they had died, it was a different story entirely. It became an intense fight to find out what's doing this. It's my job to stop it. We didn't know what it was. We didn't know where it was coming from. We had no test for it. Every test that we used came up negative. And so it became the whodunit of the century. It really was. Actually, there was some progress. A CDC intelligence officer, Dr. William Darrow, was patiently tracking down everyone who had sexual contacts with the grid patients. They wouldn't be able to tell him the cause of the disease, but they might help reveal how the epidemic was spreading. We interviewed these two men in the West Hollywood Clinic in Los Angeles. They both named a person that they had had sexual contact with who was not from the Los Angeles area. He had also been diagnosed with Kaposi's sarcoma. But we really didn't realize the importance of this person until later on that evening, we drove all the way out to Orange County. And we talked with a man who said that he had met a flight attendant uh, at one of the bathhouses and named this person, who was the same person that these two people had named earlier in the day. And that turned out to be the person that we subsequently called patient zero. Zero originally was O for out of California. Patient Zero turned out to be a Canadian airline steward called Gaten Dugas. His job took him from coast to coast in the USA and across the world. The CDC had no one to do the sophisticated computer analysis the data required. So Bill Darrow worked with coins and paper clips to see how patient zero connected with all the nine cases in the Los Angeles area. To continue his research, Bill Darrow needed to find Dugas and talk to him. He was not the only one looking for the airline steward. Dr. Friedman Keen had also come across the name, and a chance meeting on the West Coast was to open up the research. I was invited to talk in San Francisco about this new strange epidemic of, uh, of what was then called gay-related immune deficiency, or GRID. Um, and I talked about Cap C sarcoma, and a young doctor came up to me after the meeting and said, I have a date tonight with a French-Canadian Airlines steward who has Cap C sarcoma. And I said, is his name Gaten Dugas? And his jaw dropped. And I, he said, yes, how do you know? And I said, well, we've been looking for him. Could you ask him to contact me? Two months later, Gaten Dugas responded. Suddenly, I got a telephone call, and uh, he came to see me. One of the most handsome, uh, seductive individuals I've ever met, and he was enchanted. And indeed, he had cap sarcoma, and was initially extremely cooperative. Dugas agreed to visit the CDC's headquarters in Atlanta. The information he gave the team was crucial. And he was very open and very honest with me. Uh, again, we had something in common. We both wanted to try to figure out what was making him and so many other people so sick. In fact, it was killing them. So he was very cooperative, and he gave me the names of 73 different people that he had had sexual contact with in the past five years. Bill Darrow set out to track them all down. The search led him to Fire Island, to the group of friends who'd first fallen ill. Gaten Dugas had been with them briefly during the bicentennial celebrations in 1976 when the big ships came to town. That's when all these people were together. 
and then they had scattered to the four corners of the earth, and all of them had fallen ill. So maybe it was something that they were doing in 1976 when they were together in New York City that accounted for this horrible disease. Dr. Darrow worked night after night, contacting and connecting the rest of Gayton's lovers. Since the single common element in their lifestyle was sex, evidence was growing that that was how the disease was passed on. Ultimately, through this process of asking the patients or their surviving partners for their sex uh, partners of the cases, we're able to connect as many as 40 different men. This one patient, patient zero, was critical because he not only linked those cases in Los Angeles, he linked other cases throughout the world. It was a very important uh, moment, I think, in us being able to identify the possible cause of the outbreak. Jerry Rosenbaum remembers patient zero, but without recrimination. With hindsight, he was more humble than the cause. He hooked up with my group of people. He really did get around. Uh, but the net net of it was uh, I had sex with everybody he had sex with. So what's the big deal here? I mean, who knew that, though? I, mean, I didn't. Uh, I never made that cognitive connection. I mean, where did he get it? Where did Gaten get it? I don't subscribe to Gaten being the ground zero person. I had the same lifestyle. Uh, it would have come into my group and everybody else's life just as surely as it did this time. But the evidence for sexual transmission was still circumstantial. The airline steward continued his lifestyle, unwilling, like many others, to believe he was infectious. He went on visiting the bathhouses, though Selma Dritz tried to stop him. I'd get a report, this guy is in the bath and he's having sex with the others and he's telling him, I got it. I told him, if you see him again, tell him we got to see him. He came up one afternoon. I was on the phone. When I finished, he was sitting by the desk. He had, oh, he was so handsome. It was heartbreaking. I said, you've got to stop this. You've got to stop going to the baths. You've got to stop infecting a dozen people a night. He said, nobody's going to stop me. It's my civil right. I said, it's not your right to take somebody else along with you when you die. Grid did not change gay lifestyles overnight. Although there was now strong circumstantial evidence that it was transmitted through sex, doctors were anxious not to encourage homophobia. There was no official warning about the possible dangers of sex. Marcus Conant in San Francisco was one of the few doctors prepared to tell gays what they wouldn't tell each other. In my own practice, I had men who I was treating, that were treating for this disease, who were telling me that they were going to the bathhouse that night. And so you realize that even very bright people had reasons not to disclose. I can remember one man and I said, why aren't you telling me? He said, it's my view that people know that this is the way this disease is being spread. If they want to engage in this behavior, that's their business. It's not my job to be my brother's keeper. Within the CDC, there was disagreement. Some researchers already suspected it was infectious, but to announce that without proof would have excited unwelcome controversy. What I, I regret is that uh, we weren't tougher. We wanted not to alienate the gay community, and they didn't want to hear from us that you can get this from having sex. And so we said, we think so. We think so. We're not sure. I think I would have said now, I would have been strong, I would have said, this can kill you. Those of us who saw what was happening made every effort to make people aware of it. Marcus Conant did it in San Francisco. I did it in New York. Other people in New York did it. It just didn't take hold. You can't tell people to stop having sex. It just doesn't work. 
One person who did try to promote change was Larry Kramer, author and founding member of the Gay Men's Health Crisis Center. The main message of Gay Men's Health Crisis uh, was not given out at all. It was to spread information which they refused to do because to tell gay people to stop having sex or to cool it was such a controversial thing in those days that no organization was prepared to make that make that statement and I became a pariah basically for making that statement and for many years people simply wouldn't talk to me I was thrown off of the board of GMHC because I said these things Roger McFarlane an equally dedicated member of the same organization was one of those opposed to Kramer and to warning against sex Kramer was right only in retrospect Kramer was dead wrong at the time we know he's right now but he had he had no case to make other than you know other than highly he had predictions which were proved true. I felt there were any number of plausible scientific reasons for this. God knows what it is. Don't tell me you know it's sexually transmitted. On what evidence? Says who? And for those of us who had only discovered our powers, our liberation, through our sexual liberation, it sounded like people were all too ready to say the wages of gay sin are death. This is, it was, it was patently absurd. Then, drug users began falling ill. To some, it proved being gay was irrelevant to the disease. To others, it simply meant that some drug users and gays had the same sexual tastes. People wanted to believe that you could only get it through um, homosexual intercourse. They wanted to believe that women couldn't get it, and they wanted to believe that you couldn't get it through any other way except through anal intercourse. Mary Guinan was sent to investigate the intravenous drug users. I was afraid. Uh, I had a number of experiences with drug users and knew them very often to be violent. And I uh, would interview them by myself. And I would always select a location like a restaurant or uh, a place that I thought was safe. I, I remember the first uh, man that I saw who was, uh, he brought his girlfriend with him. He had just gotten out of prison. He'd served time for drug use. And many people believe that in jail, men have sex with men all the time. As we went through his story and where he had, whether he had shared needles with other people, and he had, and he had never had sex and with, with men, and uh, even under forced circumstances, after that interview, I, I was convinced that there was a concern about it being transmitted via blood contact. Mary Guinan went back to argue her theory that it was an infectious agent in the blood, potentially threatening everyone. Jim Curran was not convinced. He felt her informants might simply not be telling the truth about their sexual habits. But down in Florida, a further challenge was emerging to his gay behavior theory. Haitian immigrants being looked after by Dr. Margaret Fischel were going down with the same complaints as gay men. But none was homosexual, and some were women. We now felt we were seeing a similar syndrome, but we're seeing it among those who came from Haiti and who were heterosexual and therefore trying to piece together what was really happening. Uh, was this indeed an infectious agent? Dr. Fischel was certain that it was an infectious agent, but she found little support for the argument among the behavior theorists at the CDC. And we went through the whole scenario of were they really gay and we weren't getting that information. Was this hooked to voodoo in some way? Uh, it was just very difficult, even in the establishment, to break through that this could be transmitted heterosexually. I think there was a tremendous reticence from uh, investigators and physicians at the Center for Disease Control. They did not believe we were seeing what was eventually called AIDS among those of Haitian ancestry. The reluctance to accept the idea of a new infectious disease was, in Jim Curran's opinion, understandable. The evidence was not conclusive, while the implications were daunting. We don't want problems to be caused by things 
like uh, viruses that last for 10 or 12 years for which a, a cure and a vaccine may take decades. Uh, we wanted to be able to put an end to this problem. We wanted it to be um, something that was uh, solvable quickly. The next piece in the jigsaw puzzle was found at the Jackson Memorial Hospital, Miami. It shattered any hope of a quick solution. Spencer Makartos received an emergency call that his father, a hemophiliac, was critically ill. And by the time my brother and I had gotten down there, my father was basically unconscious. And the doctors were stupefied. They had no idea, not a clue, what was wrong with him. Um, he had a type of pneumonia that really was, would not affect people, would not bother them normally. Um, it seemed as if the immune, his immune system had let go, and they had no idea why these things uh, were affecting him so while he was while he was deteriorating so rapidly. It was very frustrating to watch someone you care about literally deteriorate and die in front of you, right? The death was reported to Dr. Bruce Everett, who was in charge of the CDC unit which monitored hemophiliacs. The possibility that Mr. McCarter Sr. had been gay or a drug user had to be eliminated. Everett telephoned the family home. I got a call from a doctor uh, from CDC, um, and he explained to me at that time that it was something new and uh, it was the first case they had run across, and they were quite interested in, in other factors that we may have known about. Well, my father certainly wasn't involved in drugs or he wasn't homosexual or anything along that line, so there was a question in our mind <clears throat> how he would have gotten it. It was a question in Bruce Abbott's mind, too. He searched back through the records to see if there were any requests for pentamidine for hemophiliacs. It was the large increase in demand for this drug which had alerted the CDC at the start of the epidemic. There were none, but he asked his team to keep a lookout, and they didn't have long to wait. A request came in June 1982. Bruce Abbott immediately sent an intelligence officer to investigate. We then began dreading very much we would see the third case, and sure enough, at the first part of July, the third report came, request for contaminating came in from Ohio. By this point in time, we were fairly convinced that we had three cases. Bruce Everett was now convinced that the donated blood used to treat these hemophiliacs must have been infected. In the past, it would have been simple to trace the donor, but now it was impossible because most hemophiliacs were treated with something called Factor VIII, made from the blood of over 2,000 donors. Although the infected blood could have come from any number of sources, including drug users, the sad irony of the situation was that many gay men were particularly generous when it came to donating blood. At the CDC, they were convinced they had found the link between the deaths in the hemophiliac patients and the so-called gay plague, and that link was blood. These three cases could only have been caused by a contamination of the concentrates they had received um, by a virus. Uh, it changed the attitude of all the people who had uh, hoped for or espoused uh, environmental hypotheses. It became apparent to everybody there that we must be looking now for an infectious agent, most likely a virus. This week's report from the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta reveals disturbing new evidence. Three cases of the disorder in straight, otherwise uninfected, hemophiliacs. With that news, the words gay-related were quietly dropped from the official description. AIDS, or Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, was born. Local news gave it some attention, but there was no firm action. Despite the evident dangers, there was little sense of official urgency that year. No extra funds, no great public warning. Many individuals at the Centers for Disease Control did wonderful jobs early on collecting information, identifying what the possible cause was, but something broke down. From that level, the mid-level scientists, up to the policy makers, and then right up to the Secretary of Health and Human Services, and in fact, the President of the United States, this barrier came down that said, 
you cannot do this. And it was that obstacle which occurred in the early start parts of the disease and has in fact persisted up until the present time. That has not changed. That has been one of the major obstacles to education, to prevention, to treatment. That's one of the first instances indeed of how uh, you know a few cases has literally allowed to uh, become first an epidemic, then a pandemic, and now a plague. It's just one of the most horrific stories in the history of medicine. And the people who have blood on their hands, the mayor of this city and the president, Ronald Reagan, I mean, these people are responsible for this plague because they all knew it was happening. For most people from those heady days on Fire Island, recrimination like that is too late. The party is over. The band is gone. It has to be like somebody would feel if they were 85 years old. I still have so much I want to do, and I'm doing it without most of my peer group. They're all gone. Ed White said that every time a friend dies, it's like a library burning down. It really is. The people that tell me that I was here, the people whose face I look in and, and remember what we did together, all those guys are gone. And that's, there's a part of me that finds that horrific and I don't know how to deal with it. Apoio Cultural da Livraria Cultura. É fácil encontrar o livro que você quer. 